Andy Kirshen, an associate vice provost with Rutgers University and the Sacramento Center for Graduate Studies. This is the first in a series of conversations that uh, we are starting to undertake for the community, and we're hoping to showcase the brilliance of five of our best PhDs in economics and finance tonight for, for you to take a look at and understand a little bit more about Drexel University. We have a number of people in the room tonight. Some of you are uh, students of ours, others of you are alumni, some of you are prospects who are looking at us and thinking about joining us as students, and others of you are members of the community who are just taking advantage of the expertise that we hope to bring to you tonight. I do need to tell you, hey Meg, how are you from Sarah? Uh, we are just going to give you the littlest taste. We just have an hour <coughs> with these guys tonight, so we're going to jump right into the conversation. I would like to point out a couple of people that you might like to know before we get underway. I have a couple of folks in the audience here that uh, need introduction. One is Chris Levermore. Chris, you want to stand up and say hello? Chris is the president of the GSA Graduate Students Association. And Jim Gravison, I don't know where you're getting Jim, he is the president of the Northern California Alumni Association. So if you'd like to know more about the institution, what it's like to be a student or an alum, I'm certain that either one of these gentlemen will engage in this conversation later tonight. We're really glad to be here. Now, without further ado, I'm just going to turn this over to our moderator tonight, another notable individual, president of the uh, Alumni Association with the Graduate Center here, and that's Steve Fong. So, Steve, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to moderate this uh, very talented panel this evening. And I realize we are very short on time and have five presentations to get through or, or, or five uh, viewpoints to get through. So I would like to um, start off right away, and I'm not sure what order we're going in, but uh, are, are we going to left and right? Okay. We'll start with that. Can you get them here? Chris? Um, what I'm going to do is, I've got a, just a couple of tables. If you, if you look that way, you know, with exorcist <laughs> pen. You, so, this is going to be a little small to see, so you might actually have to do that. But I'll just talk it through. It's only a few, couple of charts, but when you're talking about math and finance, you've got numbers and you've got to just throw them up here. Okay? So, um, breaking news. <laughs> but it's not what you think. It's not, I'm not, I'm not really talking about subprime mortgages. I'm not talking about toxic balance sheets. I'm not talking about uh, poor credit. Um, I'm talking about something else, something that, that impacts you and your investment strategies for your retirement, for your everyday investments, for your 401k plans, for your 403b plans, whatever. This is more, as bad as the other is, this is equally important to you. Now, for some of you, you were, next slide, please, it's not working. Um, for some of you, I see some of my classmates, classmates, students, you've already seen this. This is what we should expect. This is a chart of various asset classes over a period of 1926 to 2005, so a very long period of time. This is, what, this is the relationship we should expect. For risk and reward, we should expect for the little amount of risk that we assume investing in treasury bills, bill the debt that matures, guaranteed by the government matures in only 90 days or so, we shouldn't expect a high return, should we? But we should expect, we assume the risk of investing in small company stocks, stocks that are subject to pricing pressure, capital deficiencies, and so forth. If we assume the risk, we should expect, not guaranteed, that we should uh, get the reward. I mean, not get, but you know, we should expect the reward is the better word. Okay? And over 80 years or so, this is the relationship. It's not linear, but it's darn close, isn't it? Pretty impressive. Corporate bonds would be about in the middle. Okay, fast forward to October. This is the headline in Bloomberg. Say what? In a 30-year race, bonds beat stocks. That's counter to this, isn't it? Risk-reward. What we should expect as we put together our asset strategy, retirement strategy, investment strategies for retirement. So what that's saying is this, outperform this, not over a short period of time, but to 30 years. That's trouble. And that goes back to the original slide. Okay? But before, now most people who, 
the average investor, when you see headlines like that, this is October of this past year, when you see headlines like that, you tend to go, well, whatever was, will be. Right? Extrapolate what you've seen into the, just like we saw in the previous slide. Right? Okay, but let me put that in perspective, and if you have to turn around, feel free to use it. For if you held a diversified portfolio of stocks for three years, any rolling three-year period between 1926 and 2000, and, uh, excuse me, 1925 and 2009, there are 973 of them. Stocks would be bonds 70 percent of the time. Any three-year period. If you held them for 10 years, 83 percent of the time. If you held them for 20 years, any 20-year period. Stocks beat bonds 96% of the time. So perspective, you can see that this headline is an outlier, isn't it? Okay. How many of you would take those odds to Reno? <laughs> <laughs> then why do we see headlines like this and change the way we do business in, in a panic, in an emotional state, emotional decision-making? Let's go back to the data. Now, I've often heard people say, well, I don't invest in stocks. I lost money in stocks. And I'm thinking, I don't know how you do that. Now, some of you go, now what? I mean, everybody loses money in stocks. But it's really difficult to lose money in stocks. Let's go to the stats. Stocks positive. It's this middle number if you want to turn it. Stocks positive. If you held a diversified portfolio of stocks for any three-year period, so a short period of time, between 25 and 2009, stocks were positive. Didn't mean you made a lot of money, just they didn't lose money. Thus, the statement, I lost money in stocks, 83% of the time. If you held them for 10 years, 95% of the time. If you held them for 20 years, 100% of the time. It's through 2009 now. That's through the misery. So it's not you know, data mining to get the answer we want. And this presentation, actually, I've seen this over and over, updated for, you know, as we go, as I've aged. You're going to talk about the stocks. You're talking about the stock index, correct? I said, diversified portfolio of stocks held for lengths of time. And that is, you're just stealing my little... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That was how I was going to finish. <laughs> okay. Next question. Don't call him. Next, <laughs> Next question. I was the uh, investment consultant for the $1.5 billion Alabama Oil and Gas Trust several years ago. And that meant that my client was the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the state treasurer. My job at one point was to go out and hire new investment managers to manage a portion of this $1.5 billion oil and gas trust. And when, you know, um, talking to the board, and the state treasurer pipes up and goes, well, I don't know why we're doing all that. Why not just look at the track record of these bond uh, funds and just pick the best ones? Those of you who, are in, who have already had one of my classes, you know, I mean, I was just like, you know, that's heresy in finance, isn't it? For a state treasurer to say it's worth. So let's go to the stats. Let's, ask, let's answer the question, that she's implicitly asking. Do winners repeat? Okay, it's hard to see, but what we're going to do, and this study has been done over and over and updated and updated, same results, and I'll just tell you what the data points are so you can't see it. All right, let's say that we take a 10-year period. Let's stand in 2005, looking backwards, as the state treasurer would have done, and ranked, ordered, the best investment managers, this is for stocks at this point. I'll do bonds in just a second. Stocks at this, at the best stock uh, returns, the, the investment manager with the best returns, and order them from best to worst, and group them into quartiles. So we have four groups. We have the top quartile and all the way to the bottom quartile. Best to worst. Okay, according to the state treasurer, we should then be able to take the top quartile, looking backwards, and hire an, a manager out of that best quartile, and we should expect to see winners repeat. This is an academic question, by the way. Lots of academic studies, lots of paper thrown at this question. So now let's look at the other column, the answer. 
Do winners repeat? Well, let's take the top quartile, which you can't see, but it's 284 funds. The total column was 1,135 funds, so it's not uh, you know, a small sample, so it's a very robust sample. 284 funds in the top quartile. Let's follow them for the next five years. So 19% of them repeated, one in five. Best half, the next 14%. So what we're talking about is 33% top half. So one in three, top half from a previous best place finish. So two thirds finished worse and many of them actually went out of business, closed the fund. And usually when you have a closed fund, that's not good news. <coughs> it's actually worse. So we're talking about probability again. Nothing, when we're dealing with the future, nothing is guaranteed, or few things are guaranteed. But so we look in finance, and in, you know, we don't like probability, but that's really all we've got. So probability, we're dealing with one in third that the state church, at least on stocks, was correct. I don't like those odds. Let's look at bonds, which is more specific to the state treasurer's question. We have 592 bond funds, same time period, five years up through 2005. Then we order them, we rank them best to worst, group them in four categories, four, uh, four quartiles, then follow the top quartile investment fund managers for the next five years. Do winners repeat? 23% of the top quartile funds repeated, 23%, one in four. 24% actually at least made the top half. So we're dealing with about 50% went from top to top half. 50% didn't. Coin toss. So it's really, in terms of predictability, just not, the stats just don't back up the statement of the state treasurer. I center a version of this, by the way. Part of my role as a consultant, and it will be for yours, if you are a consultant at some point, or if you are one now, is education educating your client, not, not telling them they're wrong or stupid, which <laughs> I wanted to, <laughs> but education, telling them, just showing them the data, showing them the evidence, and then as board members, very talented, smart people sitting on the board, let them then make the decision. That's what I did anyway. I think that's a really good way of doing things with clients. Okay, that's it. The data. So the key, thanks to the gentleman in the back, what's the moral of this story for you and your 401k, 403b plans, investments? We're in the middle of misery. Do we go chasing bonds? You might. What, what are the, what's just basic boilerplate? Where are the numbers in your favor? Diversified portfolio, time. Don't chase necessarily the winners. Thank you. I've got to go to you. Hey, good evening. My name is Ed Arnheider, and I'm an East Coast guy. I've only been here for three months. Uh, prior to uh, September, I'd only been on the East Coast three or four times my whole life. Um, spent most of my life in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Grew up in upstate New York. And I spent uh, 13 years teaching at uh, Rensselaer Polytech, RPI. You may know that school, I'm taking work. Uh, primarily an engineering school, but there's also a business school there where I taught. It's called the Valley School of Management. I taught there for about 13 years. So my focus in my teaching as well as my research <laughs> is operations management. And what I want to talk to you about tonight is the idea of lean management, which is the focus of my, a lot of my work over the last 13 years has been lean management, as well as something called Six Sigma. So how many of you have heard of lean, lean management, lean introduction, and the third about Six Sigma? More on that. That's, that's not surprising. Um, and how many of you work in the, like, I would say the service industry, service sector? Anybody in manufacturing? Not many, it's part of the country, I guess. 
Um, in Connecticut, where I spent a lot of my you know, last 10 years, we, we have a, a corporation um, called United Technologies Corporation. It's a Pratt Whitney, Otis Elevators, Four Speed, uh, Helicopter, Carrier, Air Commission. And they're manufacturer in Connecticut, and they probably, it seems like they, they, they employ half the state, quite frankly, uh, either directly or indirectly through their their suppliers and tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers. They've been very good, good for the state of Connecticut over the years, for sure. Uh, but they're, they're a, I would consider a lean company. Um, lean management started out uh, really at Toyota in the 1950s. But they never called it lean. Lean is actually an American term given to it by a research team that worked on a book in the late 80s uh, called The Machine That Changed the World. If anybody wants to get started learning about lean, I, I, I would recommend this book, uh, The Machine That Changed the World. Very good book. Jim Womack is, is the primary author on this. There's a team from MIT, uh, with Womack and Roos, or, or, or S. And Jones. And they followed that up with a book called Lean Thinking. And quite frankly, this is a more popular book. It's, it's really written in layman's terms. Lean Thinking, mid-90s, uh, late in 96 is, is certainly uh, But very good book in terms of what Lean is. Uh, and then the first book, The Machine to Change the World, is where they coined the phrase Lean Production for the first time. And now we call it Lean. We don't call it Lean Production. We call it Lean Management because we don't want to exclude our friends in the service sectors and non manufacturing operations. And out here in California now, I know in this area there's not as much manufacturing. But it doesn't mean you can't use lean. Okay? It doesn't mean you can't do more with less. And quite frankly, in these economic times, I would suggest that uh, more so than ever, we can look at something where we can do more with less and uh, drive out waste. One of the misnomers about lean is maybe if you've worked long enough in the 80s and 90s, you used to use the term lean and mean a lot. Um, that meant a lot of layoffs usually. Um, it's not really what lean is as it should be, as I view it, as, as lean thinkers view it. Um, in fact, lean, if done correctly, does not have any layoffs involved other than perhaps uh, natural attrition or reducing staff over a long period of time, retirements, uh, people leave, you don't replace them, that kind of thing. But you can view it as a system of reducing waste in all steps of the value, the value chain. So those are two very good books. Also, a common tool within Lean, you may have heard of it, is uh, Kaizen. Kaizen, people do Kaizen events today. How many of you have done Kaizen events? That's one tool within Lean. Typically, you take a few uh, people from a um, cross-sectional team, and you turn them loose on a problem, and they spend two to, say, five days, the longest one you would ever do, in a room and on the floor, sort of, you know, factory floor or office areas where the, wherever the problem being analyzed lies, and just focusing on that problem and trying to make that process better. So Kaizen is a big tool. Lean is all about looking at processes. And when you think about it, everything's a process. Coming here tonight was a process, going home is a process, getting education is a process, getting married is a process, all this in the processes. Um, and every step of that process has steps that are non-value added and value added, right? I'm not sure about the marriage part, whether that's <laughs> value added. I am very say that, I guess. So, with that process, those processes all have opportunities for driving out waste and saving some money. And if done correctly, we can, we can perhaps, I've seen companies the last uh, couple of years stave off layoffs, uh, delay offshoring, delay closing down because of lean effort. It's not a panacea. It won't save a bad design or a bad, bad management uh, or a poor product or service, but it will, it will reduce your cost and you will stay safe. <laughs> um, the, in fact, the, I just see recently some trends that show manufacturing coming back to the U.S. in some ways uh, in, in small pieces, and that's a good thing. So what's happening, of course, is, is the wages offshore are rising. Uh, China, for example, wages are rising and we're becoming more competitive here. And also because the demand for manufactured goods is going to increase as people become more affluent around the world, 
we're going to have people looking for more manufactured items that everybody wants to have flat screen TVs and so forth. So we, we have to find new manufacturing opportunities, new manufacturing locations. So in my view of manufacturing will spoil in the next few years uh, research here in the US. The bad news is that that's the good news. The bad news is I think if you see the numbers, the, the wages are uh, not what they were before the company left to go offshore. <coughs> so the wages are less by a, a lot, 30%, 40% less than they were before the company offshore to work. So people are having to take concessions on, on wages. $30 an hour automotive job now pays $18 an hour. So good money by hourly wages, but not the price. So that is happening. Um, looking at value streams, uh, we use that term a lot in the lean. In fact, there's a great, another book, on the books tonight here, I guess. Um, if anybody looks at, we look at, we've all done flow charts. Since we're little kids, I'm sure, I can flow charting. Uh, a value stream map is a flow chart, really, in an elaborate manner, with agreed upon symbols and um, tools that we use to analyze our value stream for the first step we're doing is the lean initiative. Looking at a value stream, and once you identify the steps in the value stream, you look to simplify it. What you want to do is get work done faster. Less labor, less time. This is a good book called Seeing the Whole. It's done like a you know, light, flat, it's really a, a very workbook type arrangement. I have to see a lot of the books that you still see today are based on Toyota's so idea of making cars, right? So this book, they give examples of making car parts and so forth. There's not a lot of stuff out there yet in the service sector for Lean. We're starting to see that now. We see healthcare applications in Lean. We see bank examples, bankers using Lean, uh, insurance companies, all those things. Uh, there are applications out there. Everything I've shown you can, with, with, with proper thinking and proper um, planning, can be used in the service sector, even education can use. There are applications out there. There was a fellow who, maybe you've heard the name before, W. Edwards Deming, D-E-M-I-N-G, quality guru, he died in 1993. Um, he was in the 90s when he passed away, very, very well, he lived a long life, and up until the day he died, he was working as a consultant in, in, in quality. A lot of what he started with the Japanese that carried on with and the lean system was born. But we see a lot of roots in him, his idea of driving out fear, for example, part and parcel. I mean, drive out fear in the workplace. You, I, I totally agree this is one of the most important things you can look at is, is driving out fear because fear stifles a lot of creativity, free, free uh, flowing thought, Really, people don't take chances when there's fear. But I don't mean, mean just fear in terms of the hourly workers, or, or the sorry, but both, both, both elements. Um, losing your job, you're afraid of that, you can't, you can't be creative. So driving out fear is very important. Uh, and Lean strives to, to minimize that. that um, also, it's a very people-based system. So we have respect for people in Lean. We try to drive out fear, we provide training for employees. All the things I'm saying, I'm sure you've done in, in pieces where you work or maybe where you have worked before. Okay. But every every sector can use elements of lean. Um, maybe not some production elements of lean, like just in time production and pull ideas with, with, uh, with the Kanban cards. A lot of that is really better suited for manufacturing. Right? So maybe you don't use that piece of it, but there's always pieces you can use. And the, General philosophy, really, which I think if you go back to the people part of it, is the most important part. It's the hardest thing to do as well. A lot of the tools we can do very easily. The tools and techniques aren't that complicated, they're very straightforward. The hard part is, is the people part of it, the soft stuff. I'll try to do with that. Um, discipline and training. Denny was a big believer in training as well. You train, you train, you train some more. Make sure your workforce uh, has up to date skills. Help them become a better employee. We view managers as big as really now as mentors versus you know us versus them. In fact, um, 
an idea of self-directed workforce comes into play, right? Self-management. Good article on HBR in December, and I'm using in my class, normal as well, on um, Morningstar, local tomato processing company. Is Paul here tonight? Oh, yeah, your company uh, uses that uh, sort of self-management idea that really has <coughs> think it's a great idea. Um, <coughs> visual techniques very powerful. Visual tech. So a lot of lean, what I've seen in the service sector applications, people always start with some visual stuff because it's very easy, very straightforward, but very powerful and gives you a, a, a big bang for, for your buck uh, for a small amount of money. Uh, signage, uh, labeling everything properly, organizing well, missing clutter, right? all those things. In fact, the really lean companies that you visit you know, if I go to UTC back in Connecticut, even the office series have, have, have been lean now and people have labels where the staplers go and they have labels where the paper clips go and so forth. Everything, can, they audit that every month. You know, kind of office clean. So many of us can, have, can say they've got a very clean and lean office. Um, probably not very many. Um, water, so it's a very, very uh, minimal system. So it's all about simplifying versus, versus um, complicating things. So that's all I want to say on lean. Uh, that summarizes it well. I, I was hoping to have a chance for any questions that might be. Yeah, any other questions. They have teach you in four minutes. So those of you who are really yeah. right. how long was I going? No, quick question. So uh, back to class and teaching now at six o'clock is an operations management course in one of the sections we cover in this course about lean production and management, as well as Six Sigma. I haven't talked about too much about Six Sigma, but made famous by Motorola and most and most of GD, right? Very quantitative technique, pretty sophisticated stuff. But people today are merging lean and Six Sigma, calling lean Six Sigma. In fact. Uh, Mid uh, 2000s, I wrote an article with a colleague from RPI. Uh, we called it integration of lean and, and Six Sigma, called it LSS. And, so, and I should have trademarked that term because everybody uses that term, Lean Six Sigma. I didn't get credit for it. <laughs> uh, but now there are books on Lean Six Sigma, right? Um, so it's, it's how to combine the best of both, really. So we'll talk about that as well. So if anybody wants to hear that, um, they got the back and ball, I guess about four weeks. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, not tonight. Uh, so, nothing else. I'll, I'll let you hand it over to Romo. And thank you. Now going to class. Yeah. Like, oh. And as there is a break while they're going to class, I'm going to pass this around to you and put your business card in. And on the back of your business card, and there's a prize. So who knows which of our faculty panelists work for the International Monetary Fund? So if you think you know who, and no telling, right? And put and put your uh, put it on the back of the card. And if you don't, you know, give a wild guess. You never know. You've got a full percentage of chance, right? So I'm going to pass this around. Put your business card in there, and we'll do a drawing at the very end. My name is Ron Mongosh. I teach economics and international business in the MBA as well as the MS finance program. Uh, my area of research is in international finance, international macroeconomics, uh, and my current research is focused on capital controls, exchange rate policy, and monetary policy in emerging market countries. Now the topic uh, for uh, tonight, my topic for uh, tonight is uh, prospects for the global economy. And uh, some of those issues I cover in my international business class. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Chris here, we cover some of the issues which I'm going to talk about. And it's perfect timing as well because I just came back from a conference in Chicago organized by the American Economic Association. And we are, uh, it's a uh, uh, attended by 10,000 of the world's uh, top economists. So you can say that most of the people who are to blame for the current financial crisis were mm -hmm. present there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, you uh, have economists from the World Bank, IMF, uh, uh, fi um, 
from the finance ministry of different countries. So there was a wide spectrum of uh, people, uh, you know, finance experts and economics experts present in that uh, conference. And uh, other than presenting my paper, I also got a chance to um, attend some of the sessions focused on the global economy. And guess what they were talking about? What was the main topic of discussion? The euro. The euro area debt crisis and its impact on the global economy. So that was the main topic in most of the sessions focused on global economy. Now, what do you think was the main reason the, uh, we have this current situation in Europe, in the Euro area? What do you think is the, uh, the main reason? The answers to that? Sovereignty. Yeah. So you say you are a debt crisis. So there is, uh, of course, no. because of the uh, doing it different in different countries. Yeah. Overspending. Yeah. Overspending, especially by certain countries, uh, Greece, <coughs> Italy, Spain, uh, Portugal. So the so-called pigs countries. So they have an acronym for that: pigs, Portugal, uh, Italy, Greece, and Spain. I don't know who came up with that. <laughs> Definitely not the authorities <coughs> from those countries. <laughs> now, I so when I was sitting, uh, when I was uh, attending those uh, sessions, I wrote down the list of uh, reasons people came up with. Uh, uh, one was uh, the increasing uh, globalization of finance, so the interlinkage between different countries. Then uh, easy credit uh, uh, conditions during the period of 2002 to 2008. And, uh, and that led to high risk uh, lending as well as uh, borrowing practices. That was one of the common reasons given. International trade imbalances, uh, <coughs> real estate bubbles, some of, uh, some of that, and most of that has since burst. Uh, slow economic growth in the euro area since 2008, uh, fiscal policy choices related to government and uh, re government revenues and expenses and so on. Uh, so what do you th so most of you here feel uh, that it was just overspending that caused it, right? The mismatch between monetary policy and fiscal policy. Those are some of the reasons. But I think the primary reason why uh, we had the euro area uh, or we had the current euro area uh, debt crisis because the design of the currency union was flawed in the beginning. So we had, so you have the Euro area currency union form. The basic premise was flawed. We have this theory called optimum currency area in international finance, which has, which lays out some criteria as to what are the conditions necessary for uh, countries to form a currency union. And most of the main criteria were not fulfilled in the Euro area. One of the main criteria was um, having, the con having the control of monetary policy. And that, that was definitely lost because of the formation of the UA. So you need labor and, uh, labor and capital mobility. Capital mobility was strong in the UA area, but not <laughs> labor mobility. You need uh, um, risk share, uh, sh sharing of the risk, which was uh, which was there. But another important factor, which was not there, was uh, similar business cycles. You have different countries in the region, which definitely didn't have similar business cycles. We had countries like France, Germany, which were in a different level of economic development, uh, as countries like Italy, uh, Spain. Uh, Greece and other Euro area countries were in a different level of uh, economic development. So different business cycles as well. And also countries which formed, uh, which joined the European Union, they lost control of their monetary policy. So whenever there was any business cycle problems, the country authorities did not have any policy tool or monetary policy tool. To, to deal with that. They only had access to fiscal bonds and they used that. So the design, the design of the Euro, Euro, Euro currency union 
was flawed. So at the beginning, so it was bound to fail at one point. Uh, there were um, talk about uh, you know, solutions to the current problem. There were some short-term uh, solutions as well as long-term solutions. Among the short-term emergency measures, which uh, the, some of the ones which are prominent, most of uh, some of you have probably heard about that EF, uh, EFSF, um, European Financial Stability uh, Facility, then EFSN, which is just uh, uh, two weeks back, uh, European Financial Stabilization Mechanism, and then various forms of ECB interventions. Those are some of the short term uh, policy measures which were taken. Among the long term measures, uh, some of the prominent ones were uh, European Fiscal Union, uh, European Stability Mechanism, and even the suggestion of the breakup of the, uh, the uh, currency union. So those are some of the long term uh, solutions. Now, what, what does it mean for the US? So this debt crisis is going on in the euro area. What the, how, uh, how is that related to the US economy? Or how would the US economy be <coughs> affected by that? Global investments. Global investments. Anything else? Trade. Trade. So, um, I mean, it, it, the European crisis can definitely have a very big impact on the US economy. Uh, so US and Europe, they are big trading partners. Whatever happens in Europe can have a major impact in the US economy. It could uh, definitely reduce the demand for US products. Uh, uh, then um, another, uh, another significant uh, thing which can happen is Europe is a significant investor in the, Euro, uh, in the US <coughs> and vice versa. So any crisis in, uh, any worsening of the crisis in Europe can have a significant impact on the U.S. economy. Also, it can affect uh, Wall Street uh, because uh, the banking system, the U.S. banking system, it has heavy exposure to the U.S. Uh, to the euro area debt crisis. So that can also have a significant impact. Uh, regarding the prospect for the U.S. economy, most uh, economists believe that. In 2012, the situation is not going to improve that much. The growth rate is expected to be around 1.8 to 2% throughout 2012, and unemployment rate is not expected to decline that much. Maybe close to 8% per, uh, per year, but not, not uh, significantly lower than that. Uh, another trend which I wanted to talk about was uh, this is more of a long-term trend which is going on in the global economy. And I read an article just the other day by Javier Santiso, is the emergence of the emerging markets. So we have been hearing about, about countries like China and India and its importance in the global economy. But there has been a fundamental shift. This has been going on for more than two decades now. There has been this fundamental shift which is going on and if you look at, uh, if you uh, read the uh, report from the IMF, World Economic Outlook, global growth is expected to be around 4 to 4.5 percent. And majority of that is supposed to come from the, is expected to come from the emerging markets. And I'm, I'm going to use some uh, numbers from this article. Uh, according to HSBC, 19 of today's emerging market countries will be among the world's 30 largest economies in 2050. And they will be more important than the current OECD countries. And currently, <coughs> emerging markets already capture 40% of world GDP and 37% of FDI. So these are some of the trends which have been going on. And the middle class now represents 60% of the, uh, the, in Asia, the middle class uh, now represents 60% of the total population, uh, uh, approximately 1.9 billion people. And China in 2010 became the world's largest car market. So these are some of the things which have been going on. And these are long-term trends. Uh, just to give you uh, uh, 
um, a number to graph the speed of this rebalancing which is taking place, that in 1990, more than 95% of research and development was carried out in developed countries. <coughs> in 2000, that number became 76%. So from 95, dropped to 76%. And today, emerging markets account for 40% of the world's researchers. So these, there are some underlying changes which are taking place in the global economy, and that can have important implications going forward. And lastly, I want to uh, talk about you know, what, what, what does it mean for, especially for MBA students or uh, students in the US or businessmen in the US. So those who can adapt to these changes, if you, no matter whether you're a businessman or a student, those who can adapt to these changes will prosper in the global economy going forward. Those who are unable to adapt to these changes will fall behind. And the ones, and usually it's related to the level of education. Education, so people, uh, students or uh, workers who are more educated would do better than workers who are less educated, especially ones who are who have less than high school diploma. Even in the U.S., uh, un unemployment numbers. If you look at the unemployment rate numbers, you have uh, uh, workers with less than <coughs> high school diploma. The unemployment rate is close to 15 percent, whereas those with more than bachelor's degree, bachelor's degree or more, the unemployment rate is 4.2 percent. So you, you can see that there is a big gap between uh, the rate of unemployment uh, uh, when you look at uh, when you when you consider the level of uh, education. So that's uh, what I want to talk about. That's what I wanted to talk about in this uh, uh, event today, and I'll hand it over to Sally. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. What are some of the emerging markets that are coming up? Well, other than the two obvious uh, ones are. Uh, China and India. Uh, then Brazil is doing good. Uh, Russia, of course. And in, in Asia, you have Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, who are doing pretty good. Uh, in uh, Latin America, other than Brazil, you have Argentina, Chile. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of emerging markets. Of course, it's dominated by China and India because of the sheer size of the economy. But yeah, those are some of the other markets. Thank you. Somebody had asked me whether I had to stand up or sit down, and I could get better stand up so y'all could see me. Um, and also so the cameras can see me, I guess, I'm recording this. But I'm Sally Hamilton. I'm the person who was already living in the area when I was hired. Um, I went to Davis for my first degree, um, did my PhD at UCLA, so I've been in California for a long time. Um, <laughs> Let's just say I remember when Davis was in a dry county. Uh, and about four, yeah. <laughs> and about four years ago, we were working. I was living in the Bay Area. I I started in academia after I finished my degree, and I was putting students into internships, and I was getting jealous of my students. So I actually left academia and I worked in high tech, in finance, and in a number of other areas for a lengthy period of time. And then about four years ago, in what was the only inspired investment decision of my life, we decided we were going to leave the Bay Area and move to Davis. A lot of reasons for it, but we actually managed to get out of there before the whole thing imploded. Um, and I got back into teaching. I've taught online full-time, and now I'm working with Drexel, both online and face-to-face. -face. I teach in the MSF program and the MBA program. Uh, and I'm kind of wearing a number of teaching hats. I'm currently teaching accounting which no one wants to take and everyone's required to take. <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, the end of a long day of work, you know, you're looking at all these faces and there's you got a few numbers and everything else. So I decided I was not going to do slides. And I was not going to do a bunch of numbers. Okay? And I was not going to do accounting. <laughs> um, I also teach finance and econ. 
my interests tend to be rather pragmatic. Um, raise your hand if in the last five years you or someone you know fairly well has lost their job. Right, me too. Roughly half of my network either lost a job, had a company disappear, or had to reinvent themselves in the last five years. Okay, and that's kind of all across this Northern California area. And the reality is, you know, people talk about, oh, it's getting better, and it, it, we hope it is, but it's still pretty lousy. Okay, the latest headlines that they've been talking about is unemployment rate dropped. You know, it's down around 11% down from over 12%. And this is like in our regional area, like the six county regional area. Well, five years ago, the unemployment rate was under 5%. So 11 is better than 12, but 5 is way better than 11. Okay, you don't need to do accounting for that. All right, we can all figure that one out. So the reality is a lot of people in the area are working very hard at trying to figure out what we can do to kind of grow ourselves out of this problem. Okay? And so there's a lot of work being done in the next economy. How are we going to put industries in place that will continue to grow and provide jobs for people? So I kind of took a jobs focus at the idea of where is that going. Um, locally, with Satro and Sardo, the Center for Strategic Economic Research has identified six main areas of focus for industry development and jobs. And those are life science and health services, basically information technology and communications, and knowledge-intensive business and financial services, followed by agribusiness, education, and advanced manufacturing. And that was really a function of the economic attributes, you know, how many current jobs, what's the output, as well as what are some of the things that we have in place to help grow that. And it's supported also by some of the market data. And they represent combinations of both economic and locational strength, not necessarily unique to this region, but that we can definitely leverage in the area of economic growth. Now, the California Employment Development Department basically says that over the next decade, employment growth should be about 10.5%. Okay? And as you might imagine, since that's an average, you know, everybody knows the joke about, you know, the economist is the guy who drowned in a river and averages three feet deep, right? So, you know, the reality is we need to go look at the, sorry, the different economic sectors within there, right? Because if you're working in one of those sectors that's busy, you know, <coughs> spinning people off, it doesn't really help you that the economy as a whole is going to grow 10.5%. The most... The largest number of new jobs, as you might expect, in this area and in other areas, are what I'm going to call kind of the high turnover entry level sort of jobs. Retail sales, cashier, home health care aid, okay? Those are kind of entry level sort of jobs. Those are probably not the jobs most of us are aspiring to as steady, good earning jobs. So there are, in our regional area, a number of jobs with with growth over 20% over the next decade, salaries that of over $60,000 a year, okay, that also align very nicely to those economic sector areas. And I kind of took three of those areas and looked at them. The life sciences and health services area is an obvious one, both because of the educational opportunities and the existing infrastructure in the area and the existing businesses. And one of the things I really find most telling is the fastest growing area in there is going to be in the area of medical scientists. Well, a medical scientist, that means you don't have to fund medical school, right? A very small number of people go to medical school, but a larger number of people can have undergraduate or graduate education in a science area that can then be used in a business capacity, whether that business be specific to a hospital or whatever. So it's much broader than kind of the narrow idea of medical care. It's the broader health care management. It's people who work in social welfare or public health. It's people who work in um, the areas of taking their business and their science together to try and build a new business. So that's the, I would say, the majority of the jobs are going to align in that area, okay, fastest growth. 
The next fastest, or are actually fairly close together, are the information and communications technology. Most of us probably have heard about the outsourcing of a lot of IT jobs, especially to India. And it is true that a lot of the straight development or coding has been outsourced. But what isn't outsourced, and what is growing rapidly, are in the managing huge amounts of information. You know, think about it even for companies like Google and Facebook. They have huge amounts of data that they're capturing about customers and people. And, you know, it's kind of like trying to find a needle in a haystack. There's this huge pile of data, and somewhere in there, there might be something that would actually be important for them to know. And what they need, and not just the Googles and Facebooks, but many companies in many industries, including educational institutions, say, wait a minute, how do I go find that information out? So people can, who can figure out how the systems work together, how to pull the data out of them in a kind of a technical IT sense, that's where there's also going to be a lot of growth. And those jobs exist not just in technology companies. Those jobs exist all across all industries and all spectrums. The third area, and I own a little personal area of you know, enjoyment because I'm a numbers person, is the business and financial services area. So, you know, financial advisors, <coughs> job analysis specialists, market research analysts, those kinds of jobs, public relations specialists, Bill is still in here, <laughs> okay? Those are the jobs that, all, that have a business component, they have an analytical component, and those are the jobs, since after all we're business school here talking to you, those are the jobs that business educations align very nicely with kind of almost automatically, no matter what your underlying skill set. Um, I personally, over the years, have managed to survive more than one layoff because I've been able to kind of parse data and make it kind of stand up and dance on the head of a pin for management and put the pieces together for them to show and tell a story. Um, that's really where I think a lot of the opportunities are for someone who's more of the like business generalist as opposed to a specialist in a medical area or just a technology area. Um, and like I said, I decided not to do slides. There's no quiz. I had a one-page handout. Feel free to take it with you. And I thank you very much for your interest. Okay. Last but not least, uh, I think we have a few minutes left, and we'll take some questions at the end um, for those of you who can't stay. All right, so last person to speak, should I make it really long? Or I, make it? I figure since we're all in academia, we can all talk from zero to 100 minutes in a nanosecond, so I will keep it very brief. Uh, my name is Leon Schöp. Uh, my PhD is in strategy, organizational behavior, and entrepreneurship. And my advisor asked me why I could not decide on one major. <laughs> and I informed him that uh, in order to start a new venture, you have to think strategically, you also have to deal with people, and you have to behave in an organization. If we take the entrepreneur out of entrepreneurship, we have a ship. There's no anger and there's no direction. So what's the point? Why I'm saying this is because here at Drexel, I teach strategy, innovation, management, as well as entrepreneurship. The first strategy course that is taught here is called Managing the Total Enterprise. It is truly strategy that's being implemented there, functional strategy. Why I point this out is because it is truly unique for an MBA program to set up a scenario where you function as top management, then you realize that you may have some gaps in your knowledge, you get the functional areas over the next about year or so, and then in your last semester, you have perhaps the two most critical courses, in my biased opinion, that is, strategy and entrepreneurship. Strategy where you integrate everything for a large company, typically, and entrepreneurship where you integrate everything for a small or new company. Why is this unique? I've taught at several universities here in the United States, from small universities like Wake Forest, with just about 3,500 students, to the second largest university at the University of Central Florida with 58,000 students. I've taught in Europe and in Asia, and consistently I see that MBA students come in, they have a collection of courses, and there is typically a requirement, and that is the strategy course is taken in the last semester. 
But I've even seen first year MBA students take the strategy course right out there because it fit their, t or their work schedule and so on. And they walk away and they had a collection of courses and they still do not have integration. A benefit here is we start with an integrated approach, then you get all the fragments and then we integrate it again in the last term. That is truly unique and a very beneficial approach to uh, education. So today I've been asked to address when is the right time to start a new business. Um, one in ten adults in the United States are actively pursuing uh, their entrepreneurial dreams at any one time. An equivalent number for Denmark where I'm from is one in 250. Denmark is the second lowest uh, activity rate in entrepreneurial activities in the world. Um, so why is a Dane studying entrepreneurship? Yeah, because uh, I don't get it. Uh, when I get it, I'll figure another. <laughs> Anyways, on average, 1,500 new businesses are started in the United States every day. That's almost 600,000 new businesses. So if we integrate what uh, Sally covers and Ken covers in terms of finance, why do we focus on, on companies that go through an IPO? In the heyday in 1996, 642 companies went through an IPO that year. Out of the 600,000 that were started, why are we so single-minded? Maybe because we like to look at the big money that could. And it's easier to research 642 companies than 600,000. Out of the 600,000, we see that typically in a recession economy, more than that is started. It could be because people are unemployed or laid off and so on. But on average, three out of four businesses fail. And why do they do that? Many times it's because the entrepreneurs lack the discipline to do the appropriate research, do the in-depth research, but most importantly, as some of you have realized in your leadership class, you need to do a personal assessment of what is your goals and aspirations. And they don't have the self-discipline to stay with this. Most new ventures will not have a positive cash flow for two years. That means keep your job when you start your new venture. That's a critical component. That's also where most of your money will come from. On average, a new business is started with about $500 in initial capital. The really big ideas start with about $10,000. Based on that, then they go out and seek additional funding. So, in a very large part, the failure rate is due to the entrepreneurs do not have a customer-driven uh, opportunity for their business, and the opportunity that they see is not feasible for them to execute. A critical aspect in launching a new venture is to ask two questions. What is wrong with my business idea? And how do I fix it? That really shows that entrepreneurs must be flexible. Those that are rigid and think, this idea is perfect. There will be no changes. They will go out of business. I'll give you an example. Um, I was at a local steakhouse and uh, the server came up and we talked and I said, I talk entrepreneurship here. And she asked if her business idea was really good. It was an aid that could help people braid hair, learn how to braid hair. And I, I immediately start thinking, how would I learn to braid hair? Well, obviously, that's an issue today, but uh, I had longer hair. And I'm thinking about uh, the girls I met in my life that learned to braid hair and, you know, get together, slumber party, whatever, however it happens. But this aid, and this is where the higher levels of engineering really comes into play. It was a ping pong bat with two nails in it. And I thought, this is a dead product, right off the bat. But how do you tell somebody that the idea they've been brewing on for years is not going to go anywhere? So I outlined to her that the first thing she wants to do is to go in and assess whether she has an opportunity or a business idea. It's fun to talk about business ideas. If we have a dinner party, we typically come up with ideas. One of the things that drive me nuts on a regular basis is the paper clip. It's a piece of bent metal. We use it, we throw a lot away every year without even knowing it. Those dull moments 
when we realize that it is very basic premise that is behind the business, we think, why did I not think of this? <coughs> think about how basic uh, FedEx is. It is really reliability and parcel delivery. Of course, that may be a little shaky now after it's been shown that they just throw you a flat <laughs> But uh, with continuous improvement, Six Sigma, that all comes in. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but anyways, uh, there are three areas that we really need to assess when we go in and look at whether we have a business opportunity for us. First one is the market, second one is the industry, and the third one is whether we can execute. And I'm not <coughs> talking about the French guillotine, it's executing on, on our intentions. <coughs> Regarding the market, and here we're talking about the demand side of the economics part, right? I'm just seeking confirmation here. <laughs> uh, the entrepreneurs need to know how big is the market. How many customers could potentially use the product and derive benefits from using the product? We need to know how much money is spent on this kind of product category. We need to know how many units are currently sold. And many entrepreneurs think, my product is new to the market. I have no competition. <coughs> but all needs are currently being satisfied, somehow or other. They need to go in and look at how are the benefits that people will derive from using the product or service, how is that satisfying certain needs that we have and how are those needs actually being satisfied at the present time. That's on the macro level. On the micro level, the entrepreneur needs to assess whether there is a market segment that is willing to buy the product. Also, whether the customers are willing to pay for the product to achieve these benefits. Think about it. if we had to pay a thousand dollars for a cell phone, we might not go out and replace these cell phones every other year. If we look overseas where people buy their cell phones, how many would go out and buy an iPhone for a thousand bucks? Well, in Thailand, it does cost a thousand dollars. Average household income there is two thousand dollars. They will find a way to get an iPhone. Maybe not the one made by Apple, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it's bought in the street, it is big. I can guarantee you that. Um, also, whether the market segment is large enough to substantiate the entry of a new business. If it's easy for the entrepreneur to enter the business, it's also easy for other entrepreneurs to enter the business. So additionally, we have to assess whether we can build barriers to entry after we have entered this market. In terms of the industry, and here we're talking about the supply side of the business, um, we need to go out and look at, at uh, whether the industry is attractive to enter. For example, does the entrepreneur have an influence on setting the price? Or does the industry conditions dictate that there is a price ceiling? It could be, for example, the surplus uh, uh, production capacity in the industry. It could also be that there's uh, supplier cost that limits it, the price of substitute products. And we're not talking about products that look alike, but products that have the same benefits or we can derive the same benefits. And of course, the rivalry amongst firms in the industry. Perhaps the most important issue here, and this is where I really see many students fail. They can do all the technical analysis. This is the demand, and this is the supply, and this is all very good. And they've been trained in that, especially undergraduates, for multiple years. And you have, will also have done this as part of other courses. But where we really need to emphasize that is whether the entrepreneurs can execute. Do they have a mission that matches their own aspirations? Do they have an entrepreneurial team with similar aspirations? What is the risk profile? Many of you may think that entrepreneurs are risk, <coughs> risk have a high level of risk propensity. And that may be the case if somebody is looking in upon the entrepreneurs. I will contend entrepreneurs are risk averse. The reason is that they typically have a job and their business is a is a offshoot of that job. So for them, it's just the next natural step, kind of like getting a promotion. 
they do it typically, the successful ones do it on market acceptance. <clears throat> so if we take an example of a corporate entrepreneur, he, um, he took a piece of paper, he took a failed product, which is some adhesive that didn't really stick to it that well, put it together because he needed a bookmark in his uh, hymn book for, for a church singing or church choir. Then it worked well for him. That was the first market acceptance. The next market acceptance was to hand these, let's call them stick'em notes, uh, you know where I'm going, with this, right? uh, to the secretaries, and that was an appropriate term at the time when this was developed, now administrative assistance, and it was very much a success. They actually went out and asked for more. Thereby, he had tested it in a very controlled environment but he had market acceptance. Then he proposed that post-it notes would be made by 3M. If we look at it today, post-it notes, it's like paper clips. It's annoyingly how many we spend every day and throw away alone. So here, what we need to do is we need to do a self-assessment. And many times, the entrepreneurs are overconfident. We we will, I will be very successful, and so on. And when we go out and ask entrepreneurs retrospectively, did you estimate the probability of success as being high? They know the outcome, but hindsight bias will make and confirm that they already predicted they would be successful. And we've actually done some estimates. There is a, a research study right now in the review at a leading entrepreneurship journal. Uh, that has found that entrepreneurs overestimate their success by 20% when they look back and explain their success. So they are totally biased. We all do this, by the way, but uh, here in order to learn what to do when you start new businesses, it's important that we know they overestimate their own success. Also, other entrepreneurs able to execute uncritical success factors. I have seen uh, in my perspective, too many business plans about bars and restaurants. Mm -hmm. yeah. And let's think about it. So you start a restaurant, where's the money made? Typically in the bar. But if you do not have a steak in a steakhouse, you're not going to sell anything in the bar either. Where are you going to get a filet when it's ordered and you're out of filet late at night? You have to be connected within the industry. You need to have somebody that can run over to the other restaurant and get a fillet from the chef over there because they're in good terms. Also, we need to be connected up and down in the supply chain. We need to be able to go back and negotiate good terms so we can get, for example, volume discounts and so on. So we need to be connected within the industry, or as technical terms, up and down the value chain and across the value chain. Because if we're not connected, we're most likely not going to be successful in launching our business. Then another issue is how committed are the entrepreneurs? This is a long haul thing. Most entrepreneurs are involved with their businesses between 7 and 20 years. Most Harvards are after 20 years. It's a life experience. Some entrepreneurs just like to do the initial fun stuff where everything is up in the air and many balls are being dropped at the same time, and then they leave. There is a major research question, that is, why do entrepreneurs leave in favor of professional administrators? And it could be that they hate routines. It could be they are misfits. I doubt that. I just think they get motivated by other things. I've been told two minutes. That's what I think those two fingers mean. <laughs> uh, while all opportunities have room for improvement, uh, the critical issue is to identify the flaws and how to fix them. Given that entrepreneurs shape their business opportunity based on their assessment of the market, the industry, and their personal self-assessment, whereby making a, a feasible opportunity for the entrepreneurs to execute on, the best time to start a new business is now. Given the economic conditions we have today and the entrepreneurs have done their market research or market assessment, industry assessment, and self-assessment, 
and found that the opportunity fits them. The current economic conditions are great because if it works today, it will work even better when the economy improves. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Steve, thanks so much for moderating. And to the faculty, thank you so much for doing such a great job. We compressed that on you in a very short period of time, but you gave us lots of great things to think about. For all of you who've come out tonight, thank you for coming. We really enjoyed seeing you. I encourage you to stay for a few minutes and do just what Dave suggested. Shake a hand, meet an alumnus, meet a faculty person, interact with us for a little longer. We're going to be here as long as you'd like. We're delighted to have seen you. Thank you for coming to Dark City University tonight. We really hope to see you again. So let me close the formal remarks with that. Good night.